It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Angel Gallardo, who is a recently minted PhD from SMU, <coughs> Southern Methodist University, also Perkins School of Theology, which is associated with SMU. His field is uh, religion and culture, and his dissertation focused on theological integration interrogations of uh, Spanish imperialism. He's been a fellow for the Forum for Theological Exploration and a fellow for the Hispanic Theological Institute. He teaches part-time at Lexington Theological Seminary. And we are delighted to welcome somebody, a United Methodist, an activist, somebody who collaborates regularly with faith leaders, community organizers, and fellow scholars working on immigration reform, civil rights, and uh, progressive Christian engagement with 21st century issues. Will you welcome Dr. Gallardo? Hello. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. It's still morning? Yes, it is. See, I flew in from Dallas uh, yesterday evening, so I'm, uh, I'm two hours ahead of you. Um, but as a native of uh, Los Angeles, California, it's good to be back in a state that I love so much. Um, also, it pains me to see the, um, the, the disaster, the, the fires and the, um, the destruction um, which uh, have occurred recently. So we keep uh, all the people and the places um, affected by, by the fires and the destruction um, in mind. So I want to thank uh, the Dean and uh, Professor Norton uh, for this invitation. Uh, this is my first time here, and uh, it's always good to, to, uh, to learn and experience new places. I, um, I was almost late, almost, I'm going to stress almost, um, because I was having breakfast with George Lucas uh, in town. Well, I should clarify, it wasn't exactly breakfast with him. It was more like having breakfast next to him. <laughs> he was eating and I was at the table next to him. Uh, so that was, um, that was memorable. So um, thank you once again. The, uh, the, the title for this lecture uh, is Towards a Nepantla Poetics. And it's, um, it's, it's a fancy title, but we will break it down uh, together, um, I hope. Um, the subtitle, of course, is uh, Towards a Decolonial, the Teenex Theological Imagination. And as, um, and I, as I discussed with uh, Professor Norton in preparation for this lecture, she mentioned that in this interdisciplinary lecture series, you all have been um, discussing race and ethnicity and its relationship to religion. And this month, if I understand correctly, the focus is on Latinx theology and perspectives from um, Latinx scholars and um, also critical race theory. Um, is that right? Can I get an amen? Amen. All right. Good deal. Well, um, as you can see, we, uh, we are having some technical difficulties, and, uh, but we won't let that stop us uh, today. Now, I assume that everyone got a copy of the, of the uh, article, or I guess it was a chapter for today. Um, I'm assuming that everyone read it. Is that right? Maybe? Maybe not? Well, even if you didn't, uh, we will have a, um, let me briefly review it. Um, well, well, we'll review a key concept uh, but before, I, before jumping into the, some of the more technical um, theological discussions, I want to share a brief story uh, to highlight the, one of the um, aspects of embodiment, which we will be discussing today. So uh, as, as, as the dean mentioned, I, I recently uh, completed my, my PhD. Uh, but way before then, um, almost 15 years ago, when I was in divinity school, I uh, was, was fortunate enough to do an, an international field placement in Brazil. I was there for, for the summer, basically three months, and I've gone back several times since. Um, and while I was there, I was, I was mainly learning from and, and meeting with um, church leaders and scholars and um, activists uh, throughout the country. 
and, um, and in particular to, to understand the identity of um, Brazilian Christianity and the history of slavery in Brazil, um, and, and really the connection between those two. And I remember going to a church, uh, it was a small Baptist Pentecostal church outside of, um, right outside of Sao Paulo, which is the largest city, um, in a neighborhood called Morumbi. And, and I remember meeting with the, with the pastors and some of the leadership, and they gave me a tour of the community and their kind of uh, engagement with, uh, with the folks there. This is predominantly an Afro-Brazilian neighborhood um, in a, in what's called a favela or a slum or uh, an impoverished area. And after meeting with them for about two hours, um, you know, they, we went back for, uh, you know, for our things in the lobby uh, of the church. And I was struck by something. I was struck by the book stand right by the entrance. And, and I, you know, I went a little closer. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm into reading, so I'm always, what, what people are reading, what, what, what kind of sources are around, always spark my attention. And I noticed that there was a, a text of, uh, written by Jerry Falwell in Portuguese throughout, and, and, and um, it, a text by Jerry Falwell on biblical interpretation in Portuguese. And, and, as, and as I looked, I noticed that 95% of the authors on that book stand were also wealthy, white, neoconservative men from the United States. And I was, I was, uh, I was shocked but not surprised um, by, the, by the fact that here I am, in Brazil, among Afro-Brazilians speaking Portuguese, or in my case, trying to speak Portuguese. Um, and here is Jerry Falwell as the source of inspiration for how to interpret scripture. And, and I've shared that story in different, in, because it highlights different, different things. It, 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 I think it provides a window into the, the embodied nature of knowledge. And that is something that um, the author that we read for today, uh, theologian Mayra Rivera, emphasizes a lot, right? Why, you know, one of the questions that I think comes, came from that experience was, what is it about Jerry Falwell that makes him authoritative in this context? Because I would bet you, you know, some money. I don't have a lot of money, but I would bet you a good twenty dollars <laughs> that if you went to um, to rural Virginia and you went to all the Baptist churches and the Pentecostal churches, you probably wouldn't find an Afro-Brazilian author in their bookshelf. So, what is it about Jerry Falwell and figures like him? Um, that, in, that enable them, that have allowed them to become bearers of knowledge, to embody knowledge, not just in their own context, but on a global scale. All right, so I, I, I share that story to ground our reflection today. And um, as I mentioned, we are having technical difficulties, but we won't let that stop us. My, uh, my computer, for some reason, is not letting me open up the document. But fortunately, I think I can. I think I may be able to pull it off by by memory. So, our discussion, the the discussion that I want to, I want us to have today um, around race and religion. Uh, I think needs to be understood within the broader legacy of colonial violence, colonial violence in the Americas. Um, now, by colonial violence, um, I really, I, what I refer to, what I'm referring to is the, 
Of course, the process of colonization, the dispossession of land, enslavement, the eradication, whether intentional or unintentional, uh, of indigenous peoples in the production of the modern world, right? And I think that that is fundamental. That's, a, that's, a, that's kind of a sub-argument uh, to, my, to my lecture today. That is fundamental to understanding um, race and religion in our context and more importantly, the, the importance of what, I'm, what I'll be referring to as geography, and specifically of theological geography. So this is a term, this is a concept that I um, tried to develop in my own uh, research and my dissertation as a way of um, describing the sort of the religious, um, the religious framework around the natural world, people and places, um, that was at work in the colonization of the Americas. So I, I put that there as a, as a, as a placeholder. Now, for today, um, I know our time is somewhat limited, so um, I want to basically present, um, I want to present, a, my presentation will have three parts. One, uh, I want to briefly discuss um, Mayra Rivera's um, notion of embodiment and why it's important. Uh, secondly, uh, her engagement with a Chicana critical theorist, uh, Gloria Ansaldúa and uh, specifically Gloria Ansaldúa's notion of Nepantla, which is, let me spell it out. Has anyone, is anyone familiar with uh, Gloria Ansaldúa's work? She's uh, known for like borderlands theory. She's, uh, she's a big figure in like queer, queer and Chicana, Chicano studies. So um, here, let me, for those that aren't familiar. So Gloria, on Sal Dua. Uh, she passed away uh, like 10 years ago. Nepantla. And Nepantla, does anyone know what that means? Nepantla, it's an Aztec word, a uh, word in Nahuatl, the indigenous language of the Aztecs, which means in between space, sort of a, a borderlands, if you will. Right? And so uh, Nepantla uh, is a key aspect of embodiment for Ansaldúa. And, um, and basically the argument that I'm going to carry out today is that in order to, in order to develop a, a, an adequate decolonial theological imagination, we, we must have a spatial turn. This is related, a spatial turn. So that's my argument. And that's what I want to, to start with. And I, and I hope and I think that by the end of our time together, you will see how this relates to the story and the questions that, um, that I started with and will hopefully guide us into further discussion. All right, so um, what is Rivera's argument in the reading for today? I know you all read it several times, took close notes, discussed it already amongst yourselves at the local coffee shop or pub, even wrote up reflections, you know, took uh, re short reflection papers for our time here. So I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. No? Don't worry, listen. I was, I was, I was, uh, I was in graduate school recently. I know that that is wishful thinking. But if you recall, Maya Rivera, first of all, who is she? Maya Rivera. She is a theologian, um, 
at Harvard Divinity School. She's actually the first Latina to be um, to receive tenure there. Um, just a couple of years ago. And she, oh yes, she taught at the GTU. She's a Drew graduate. I think this, I think she taught at GTU right after graduate school, if I'm not mistaken, and then was uh, was was uh, snagged by by um, by by Harvard. So, um, so her, her argument is basically that, contrary to the dominant Western tradition, knowledge is embodied. Knowledge is embodied. And um, given the colonial violence that we have, that has shaped the world that we inhabit, what she calls Latina body words, which are basically creative intellectual uh, productions poems, dance, songs, music, um, philosophical treaties, like her own work, that these Latina body words have the potential to decolonize, to shift the way in which we conceptualize knowledge. And why? Because according to the Western, the dominant Western tradition, Who is or what, what types of bodies are the true bearers of knowledge? Um, white males. White males. From where? From? She doesn't say this. This, this is here me adding to her, elaborating on her point. From the global north. Think about it. Who constitutes the authority? in the humanities and social sciences. Ramon Grossfugel, who's an ethnic studies professor at Berkeley, uh, he's pointed out that white men, primarily straight white men, from five countries constitute almost exclusively what is considered canonical or authoritative in all of the humanities and social sciences. Now, what countries are those? the US, the UK, France, Germany, and if we want to be generous, Italy. Think about it. Philosophy, political science, sociology, psychology. Can you think of an influential figure in those or the other fields, including theology, that don't form part of that group? Right? So, if we are to decolonize this dynamic, to undermine, to shift this dynamic, Maria Rivera says, we can turn to Latina body words. Why? Because the legacy of colonialism has been made flesh. The liminal, queer, sexualized, racialized bodies of people bear epistemic value. Epistemic value or authority. Now this relates, and here I'm really combining parts one and two of my presentation. This relates to Gloria Ansaldúa's theory of Nepantla. Because whereas Maya Rivera emphasizes body words, Gloria Saldúa, what does this term emphasize? Right? This emphasizes, is, does, any, is anyone familiar with, her, with uh, Rivera's second, second book? Her first one was uh, The Touch of Transcendence, right? The second one was what? Professor, do you know? Dean? No? For extra credit. <laughs> Poetics of the flesh. Enfleshment. Fleshment. And you can, you should be able to hear, or to see the 
the uh, echo of the incarnation in this notion, the enfleshment of knowledge. So whereas this, whereas Rivera emphasizes the body and words, you see the Christology here, right? The word of God being made flesh and dwelling among us. And Saldúa's concept of Nepantla, which overlaps very much with, with Rivera's, emphasizes what? What did we talk about? What did this mean again? Space. space. This in-between space, this borderlands, this ambiguous, hybrid, mestizo, mestiza, mulata identity that shapes primarily, their, their focus is on women of color. Women of color. Why? Because they stand in, a, in, in the crux, right? At the intersection of a racialized, sexualized, gendered um, identity. And so they both turn to the subjectivities of, of uh, women of color. Uh, and Saldua emphasizes space. That's what I wanted to put down, space. And here, it's enfleshment. Now, like I said, one of the things that uh, Rivera is doing in this, in, I think, in her, in her work, not just in this chapter, um, but in her work, is she's attending to, she's elaborating on an insight picked up by liberation theology. And you, can, and, and you can see this in, in the, actually in the title of her first, in her first uh, book, The Touch of Transcendence, which is what? What do we mean by a touch of transcendence? Basically, that the created, that the creation is imbued with divinity. The created world, the materiality, is imbued with a divine touch. It's in, God inhabits our bodies, right? I mean, don't we say that? Don't we? Don't don't Christians profess that? Right? The Spirit of God dwells among you, in you, right? What does that mean? And she's she's trying to carry this out. And one of the things that she's trying to, you know, and this has led, you know, liberation theologians and, and uh, uh, Latinx theologians to, to emphasize lo cotidiano, which basically, you know, popular religiosity, the quotidian is, is a literal translation, but that means, you know, basically what people are doing, you know, how, like people's spirituality, people's rituals, right? The the poor, the oppressed, the marginalized as sites of where God is active, right? And one of the things that I think Rivera improves upon that kind of generation of, of, of scholars is that she notes, she emphasizes the, um, the way that sort of fragmentation of identity is not something that can be resolved, but rather something that can provide us options, alternatives. The sort of the feeling of not belonging. And here you can sort of hear uh, W.E.B. Du Bois's sort of double consciousness of being an American, but at the same time of not, not belonging, of being, a, uh, you know, that his racialized body, his racialized existence meant that he was from here, but not from here, right? That he um, inhabits in many ways a kind of in-between space, right? And so you see this kind of continuity, right? So the point that I want to stress, um, because, and this will be important, I think, for further discussions, is the Christological aspect right, that the premise here is not, is grounded in the incarnation. That's the point, right? It's grounded in the incarnation. This is Rivera's argument, that because the word that God became flesh and dwelt among us, 
and by extension, deified our bodies. Right? Isn't that the point? I mean, this, this here, and here, now you're going into more of your patristic theology, and here I'm, I'm, I'm riffing. But, um, I mean, for most of you are first and second year students, right? So imagine you've at least had one semester of church history. Yes? Amen? Amen. All right. So think of, you know, you can think of Athanasius, right? What is the point of human existence if not to become God? That's why we partake of the Eucharist. Why? So that we can become what we eat. The deification of the flesh is something that the Cappadocian Fathers and other patristic um, theologians really emphasize, right? And, and this is sort of bringing, driving this argument forward. All right. Now, what I, want to, what I wanted to do, if, uh, if I was able to, uh, to show you, I will only be able to tell you um, or explain, but... Um, what I want to argue is that they don't go far enough. Why? Even though Ansaldúa emphasizes Nepantla as, uh, and Las Nepantleras, which is a mouthful, um, to refer to basically women of color as a, as a, as a group and, and uh, to form a, what she calls, uh, I'll just put it here and then I'll erase it, a new tribalism. Basically, a, if we acknowledge that we inhabit these in-between spaces, says Ansaldúa, we can acknowledge that we have multiple identities, right? We have sometimes conflicting desires. We have inconsistencies. We're fragmented. But that is not something that can be resolved. In fact, trying to resolve it is part of the problem. Right? And again, you can see a kind of a Christological dimension here. The risen Christ still had his scars. He did not have a perfect body. He had a, one that bore the marks, the legacy of imperial violence. Right? So while Ansaldúa emphasizes space, you know, she says basically las nepaltreras, um, those that inhabit these in between spaces, can form strategic alliances for basically liberation, for deep solidarity, and this is what she formed, uh, you know, kind of in her in her in the in her work, which was published after she died posthumously. Um, in, there's, in the fourth chapter of, of that book, she develops this, this, um, this concept, a new tribalism. I was writing up with uh, Jeremiah, one of your, one of your um, colleagues, one of your classmates yesterday, picked me up from the airport and, you know, we were talking about, you know, he's from Florida and I, you know, I live in Texas and talking about the way in which kind of a tribalism divides or at least characterizes our politics today. Um, and, uh, and I thought that the term itself was very interesting. And, it, and in many ways, it's sort of, you know, it's used by kind of pundits and political scientists to describe the kind of deep divisions between Democrats and Republicans. Um, and I thought, man, how timely, how timely concept this is, right? To have a tribalism, a new tribalism, a different type of tribalism. Um, given our, our, um, our politics today. So, any, any questions of clarification at this point? It's a lot, but any questions of clarification? When you, you talk about the new tribalism, um, are you relating that to African-American women or women of color, and that is the new tribe as a part of the... Um, in between segment 
and that's the term for it is new tribalism? New tribe? Yeah, so, so um, the new tribalism, so this is Gloria and Saldua's term, which she, it's basically like her, the term that she develops to, as a solution to the problem. This is what she, her proposal, this is one of her proposals, which is basically, you know, basically what she's saying is, 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 what, is what Oprah Winfrey said in Georgia just a couple weeks ago. Women, we gotta stick together. And she actually said si sisters, and she's like, I don't mean sisters, I mean sisters. Black women, brown women, white women, Asian women, we gotta stick together and to form new alliances that further our interests. Why? Because we are, we have the most to lose, right? That would be an example, I think, of a new tribalism. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying, all, in the Oprah example, it's all the different sisters, they're that intersection of them. Mm -hmm. That's what you're saying? Yeah. Okay, cool. Just mm -hmm. for clarity. So then could men be part of that too? Because, you know, I went down the ballot, and if it was a woman or a man, I just go over to the woman. Mm -hmm. I just go around. I just lift it up again. I'm an honorary sister. There you go. Yeah, and that's the thing that it's that um, I think that that there is something there. And again, if um, I could refer you, refer you to page and number, um, and if you want, I can. But the the one of the things that she develops is the within this concept is the importance of, like I said, strategic alliance building, right? And so finding where you know where we have common, common interests, and also, you know, um, a common enemy, right? And I think that's one of the things that, uh, that a, lot of, a lot of kind of critical theorists have pointed out in terms of like the post-2016 election, that the Democratic Party, by and large, did not know how to address the class inequalities that have affected white people. And so you have this kind of like white rage from white men, I mean from, from, from men, um, as a result, right? This sort of like, hey, where are we, right? What about us? And then you see that sort of re-articulated or picked up on by someone like, like Trump. Um, but one of the things that the new tribalism encourages is, 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 is based upon is the, um, the formation of solidarity movements that transcend, um, transcend these kinds of categories and classifications. It's precisely those that, that produce the kind of colonial subjectivities, these sort of rigid, standardized hierarchies of race, class, and gender that produce the very problems that both Gloria and Saldua and Maya Rivera are trying to address. All right, last one. Yeah. Um, can, or, or will you speak more about the epistemic um, dominance by the very folks you were talking about and how, and even discursive power um, mm -hmm. over knowledge and things like that? So how, like, if I, I identify as a gay um, person of color who's white passing, like how, how do we battle against our knowledge, our words, our stories being seen as like not credible sources of knowledge or witness or power? And for all people of color and anyone marginalized for that matter, I mean, I don't know, I just feel like that's a big thing we have to battle against. That is the question at hand. That is the question at hand. I don't think, I mean, I think you said, it, in, I didn't catch your name. Aaron. Aaron? Yeah. I think you said it um, beautifully. That is the challenge. How is it that we can, that is what decolonization, what a decolonial imagination entails. 
Now, I can't flesh that out and, and it, all its implications. I only have 15 minutes left, so. <laughs> so, actually, I don't have 15 minutes left. What time are we stopping? Yeah? All right. Um, but yes, I think you've, you've, you've hit the nail on the head. Now, my, my, now how is theological geography related to all of this? You know, again, I wish I had um, the images and the maps to show you, but you will have to take my word for it. Now, my, remember, my, my critique, just to reiterate, my critique or my my argument um, as it regards to, to, um, to Rivera and Saldua is that basically in order to, that they, basically they need to take the spatial turn further. And why? Because of the colonial legacy that has rendered what I end up calling latitude as let's just put latitude latitude as a constitutive aspect of identity. So one of the so including the racialization, that's it. So what does another a way of phrasing it is what does place have to do with race. It's a nice kind of play on words. What does place have to do with race? Right? Because we tend to think of race as primarily in terms of skin color today. And I think that in the Western world that's been pretty constant for some time. But you know, the third part of my presentation had all of these well-selected, very thoughtfully selected quotes from Christopher Columbus's first voyage. Um, letters and his journal entries, it's something that I um, analyzed in my second, in my second and third chapter. Um, but one of the things that he emphasizes time and time again is latitude. Now, what do I mean by latitude? Who's got a smartphone? Who uses a smart uh, GPS on their smartphone to get around? I do. I actually used it to get from uh, my breakfast with George Lucas here. because I got, I got lost. Then, then I, I, call, I called the dean. I said, I'm lost. I, you know, I was starstruck, and now I'm lost. And I had to pull out my smartphone to get here. Right? But if you look at, if you, if you zoom in, sometimes when you zoom in or you zoom out of your GPS, what do you see? So, so I, I heard, yeah, it was, and someone else I heard, lines? Lines. Lines, right? Man. Oh, now y'all are going to get me riled up. Yeah, lines. Part of that, so that, that uh, those lines are basically, we have inherited that from the colonial, the, the Colombian enterprise, the colonial moment. And one of the things that, and this, this really came out of the kind of cart, cartography, the, all the map production that occurred after 1492, and the reintroduction of, um, of Ptolemy, and, um, and in theological circles of what I ended up calling a theological geography. And in Christopher Columbus, so for Columbus, one of the texts that we have, one of his texts that we still have, including uh, um, that, that, you know, of, not that he wrote, but of his, his own library with marginal annotations, um, is a text by <clears throat> a French theologian and cardinal called Pierre de Ali, um, who wrote a book called Imago Mundi. What is that? In Latin. 
Image of the world. Thank you, Professor. 14, uh, 1414, I believe, published in 1414. And one of the things that Pierre d'Ali theorized, remember, he's, he was actually, he was a cardinal, one of the most, he had the chair of theology at the University of Paris um, in the 15th century. So this is like, you know, just a couple, one or two generations before Columbus, right? Uh, when primarily the Portuguese are making, uh, making their, their voyages south of the, basically of Guinea, into sub-Saharan Africa, right? And Columbus is reading all these. And one of the things that he notes is how the tropics are, in fact, inhabitable. So this is the world. You have the tropic of, if you look at sort of longitude and latitude, <clears throat> right, if you have a north, north-south division, east-west, this here would be the equator. Here you would have the tropic of Cancer and of Capricorn. You see this in maps. One of the things, one of the, uh, the Pierre d'Ali's text is a pretty massive text. He published a lot. Um, in, in Imago Mundi are maps. Are maps, including one that looks just like this. And one of the things that Columbus in his writings, without going into too much detail and getting, getting distracted, is that this area, this zone, this hemispheric region of the world contains people and places that by their nature are exploitable. By their nature are exploitable. It's basically the conclusion. All right. uh, and, one, and this deviates, this is actually is a deviation from the ancients, from even Augustine, Augustine scholars tend to equivocate on this point, but what they, what they end up saying is like, Augustine didn't think that you can, you know, that human beings could inhabit the, what was called the torrid zone. What is the torrid zone? This was the torrid zone, frigid, frigid, and right around here is the temperate zone. Temperate. And, but because of the hot rays of the sun and their effects on this part of the world, the ancients thought, you couldn't, you couldn't travel through it and you could not inhabit it. It was because it was inhospitable. And so the people that inhabited here the temperate zone, were the ones that were most, that were the best situated to rule over others. Why? Because of the climate, the food, the quality of the air. They were the natural masters of the world. And so latitude, meaning where you are born, literally where you are born, determines your colonial status. Columbus, that was, that was it. And I have I had lots of examples. In his discussion about the indigenous people of the Caribbean, of, of the people of Guinea, and he, and he cites specific numbers, latitude. And one of the things that he says right, out, right off the bat, in order to prove that he is following the orders of, of, of uh, the Spanish crown, that he will produce a map. Why? Why were maps in the 1490s and early 16th century uh, important? True. Yeah, narratives, 
and first-person accounts are instrumental. And of course, this comes down to you start to see how a new emergent class, if you will, of, of um, discoverers and explorers um, beco uh, become central to developing this kind of discursive authority that becomes instrumental for European imperial control. But my point, to go back to the example I gave earlier, look at your phone. How can you lay claim to territories that you can't get to? How do we get Columbus and his, and his um, uh, colleagues would say, how do we get from here to the Indies? By maps. And that's why Spain um, established what, was, uh, what became La, La Casa de Contratación, the House of Trade, and, the, and actually commissioned a royal cosmographer. This was, a, this was a, an official position that they, um, that they created. The first one was actually Americo Vespucci, interestingly, um, to create, and, and these, these men were commissioned by the crown to create navigation manuals for sailors and captains to travel to and from basically Seville and Western Europe into what became the New World, right? Without that, the African slave trade, the, the colonization of the Americas would have been impossible. So Columbus tells the, the, his, he said, because of their location, this part is, is essential, and we'll stop shortly hereafter. Under the sun. Under the sun. Meaning, which is a, excuse me, it's a reference to a geographic location in the torrid zone. Because of the, the indigenous people's location under the sun, they are by nature slaves. And not only that, but their lands, rich in gold. Why? Because Aristotle said, you know, he, he theorized this whole natural hierarchy in which higher elements affect lower elements, and the sun affects earth in a particular way that elevates minerals, precious metals, to the surface and, and, and will enable us to acquire them easily because of their location under the sun. And all of this is part of what I describe as a theological geography at work, which, may, which means that place where people are from is a constitutive aspect of their racialized identity in the modern world. And therefore, a spatial turn is necessary in order to develop an adequate decolonial theological imagination. So, two examples. Shithole countries, where are they? Where are they? Where are they? What were they? What, what, when, when, when the most powerful man in this world said, I don't want people from there, from these shithole countries, who was he referring to? What places? People along the tropics. Honduras, El Salvador, Haiti, Nigeria. And where did he want people from? Why can't we get more people like the woman I just, the blonde woman I just met? From Sweden. How are, how are the citizens in Houston, for example, 
treated you know, differently than the US citizens in Puerto Rico who live under the sun after a natural disaster. Place matters. <laughs>